Hi, I'm Johnny Engineer Termal, and this is part three of my Bible poetry leading to the Armageddon War between the keepers and the abolitionists of usury on debts. Parable of the Sower. In Parable of the Sower in Luke 8, 18, it's shown how men react when in their minds the law of Christ is sown. A farmer went to sow his seed, he spread it all around. Some fell along the path, and birds devoured it when found. Some fell on rocky places, but died out for lack of base. Some fell among the thorns, which choked them out of living space. Some fell on fertile soil, and after having taken hold, produced a mighty harvest with the yield a hundredfold. When asked the meaning of the parable, he did reply, To you has been explained the secrets of the kingdom high. I spoke in parables to fight reverse Robin Hood, the wicked misinterpreting the tales, but not the good. Forever seeing without seeing, men will surely be. Forever hearing without hearing, you will surely see. Their hearts have grown so very cold while striving to survive. This game where money's less than debt, where all can't stay alive. Yet you have been enlightened in the search of best of ways that gives us heaven here on earth in many better days. For many righteous men and prophets long to hear and see, but they have never had the opportunity as thee. Colossians 126 says, Knowledge of the word unveils the age-old mystery to all those who have heard. The seed's the word of God and has nothing to do with wood. The Christ law is the seed against reverse Robin Hood. Your own abundance now should be supplying for their need, that their abundance later will supply you your own seed. The seed sown by the path is like the man who heard my news about the coming kingdom, but he failed to grasp the clues. The seed sown in the rocky place was he who joyously accepted it, but with no root forgot it rapidly. Seed that was sown among the thorns was he who understood, but worries of this life and wealth did choke in him the good. The word of God brings persecution, causing him dismay. So rather than accept those hardships, he soon fell away. But what was sown on good soil was the man who did succeed to spread the word, producing many times the planted seed. In John 8, 31, he says, If you have faith in me, then you will know the truth and find the truth will set you free. In Matthew 13, 52, he says, All those who teach the way to earthly heaven and that, that they soon have hope to reach are like the owner of a house who brings out from his hold all kinds of treasures valuable, the new as well as old. You'll find that if you teach the law of wise abundance use, you'll come up with your own examples showing the abuse. In Luke 6.39 he asks, With blind man leading blind, will it not be in darkest pit they both themselves shall find? A student does not rise above his teacher, but it's so, that fully trained he's like his teacher, he is in the know. No bad tree's fruit is ever good, no good tree's fruit is bad. Each tree can be distinguished only by the fruit it's had. In John 15:15 15, 15, he says, No longer do I call you servants when your master's inner business you know all. So friendship is the quality to you I attribute, and since it is now known to you, go bear some lasting fruit. Though many say they preach his word about the world to be, they're negligent if they don't speak of yoke of slavery. If they fail to accept he came to end our poverty, they're not what he calls born again because they cannot see. One may not rise above the teacher, but once fully trained, his friendship will be the reward a teacher will have gained. Armageddon War Throughout our history, we find submission to a yoke made of financial chains invisible to common folk. In Paul 2 Thessalonians 2.10, he says, They might still be redeemed, but they have not kept total truth in sight. For this, God sends a powerful delusion on their minds, so they believe that lie that causes woes of many kinds. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 5, he says, They are from here, and when they speak their worldly views, the world gives them its ear. But we're from God, and who knows God will understand our views, but who does not know God will never listen to our news. In John 15, verse 22, he notes the fact he met Ezekiel's requirement that a warning they should get. If I had not forewarned them, they'd have no guilt to adduce. But now that I've exposed the answer, they have no excuse. 
In Matthew 23, 3, 4, he says, You snakes will pay. You brood of vipers, how will you escape the hell to weigh the way? I've sent you prophets, teachers, so your sin they might decry. Some you will flog in synagogues, some will you, you will crucify. In Paul to the Ephesians six twelve, he sheds a light. It's not against the men of flesh and blood that we should fight. But it's against authorities who rule iniquity, the spiritual forces causing earth's adversity. In John 16, verse 8, of Master ruling over lands, he says the prince of this world is convicted as he stands. I doubt that Christ would waste his time where it might do less good, so it makes sense his parables fight reverse Robin Hood. Against the interest it was rebellion that he did do, against the yoke oppressing needy by the wealthy few. And Paul to the Galatians in chapter 5 verse 1, he said, Though Christ has set you free, the battle's not yet done. You must stand firm despite the odds and shed the bars he broke, and never let yourselves again be burdened by the yoke. Christ wasn't just another man with nothing much to lose. What makes his sacrifice so grand is choice he had to choose. He was a man of wealth, responsibility for which belonged to three wise kings who came and left his family rich. With gifts including gold, ensuring he would not feel need, and yet he knew the anguish of the poor so well indeed. The war he fought would end all wars. It has a special name. The War of Armageddon is the reason that he came. The keepers and the abolitionists of interest, two armies in the Armageddon war put to the test. The champion of the abolitionists is Christ outraged against the keepers of the interest, a war he waged. With violence he pointed out the bad guys on the scene. The bankers and their usury is why he turned so mean. It's true that in his day there was no other remedy. Yet still he gave his life to show the way for all to see. No violence is necessary for revolt today. With politics and open courts there is a peaceful way. Yet if he took his cross up when he had so little hope, it's time for us to take his whip in hand and start to cope. If you were to be asked what for you would be heavenly, there'd be no executions and no alleys, certainly. There would be lots of food and drink, some clothing and a home, a razor and some shaving cream, a toothbrush and a comb. If you had also trappings of a great technology, all of the tools and gadgets that use electricity, communications, education, entertainment, wealth, a staff of competent physicians watching over health, most labor that is tedious is done by robots who release you to explore the universe God made for you. And best of all, you'd want your friends to share in your success. That's why all of us will end up in heaven, I profess. In heaven, all will have their friends and family by their side. Though evil ones are silenced by a guilt they cannot hide. Within Acts 24, 15, he says it's understood. There will be resurrection of both wicked and the good. But John 5, 28 points out, the day those in their graves will rise up for the judgment on the Lord on who he saves. The good will be rewarded with a life's eternity, but wicked ones will stand condemned for their iniquity. And so our earth, this little speck of blue dust in the sky, can be a heaven here on earth. We do not have to die.